So we are in a study, and I have titled this study, True Lies, and the premise of this study is that there are some commonly held assumptions within the American culture that don't really hold up against the light of God's Word. They are actually myths. And today, we're going to look at a very popular myth, the myth that life is supposed to be fair. I want to share with you a graduation address that was given by Bill Gates several years ago. And actually, it was at not a university, but a high school graduation ceremony that he agreed to speak at. And he gave a short but rather interesting address. And he said what he wanted to do was to give the graduates knowledge of things they did not learn in school. He said, we are currently seeing a generation of kids that have come up with no concept of reality and how this actually sets them up for failure in the real world. So I, he, he gives 11 rules that they need to understand about how our real world works. Rule number one, life is not fair. Get used to it. Rule two, the world does not care about your self-esteem. The world will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself. Rule three, you're not going to make $100,000 a year right out of high school. You're not going to be president of a company right after you graduate. Rule four, if you think your teacher is tough, wait until you get a boss. He doesn't have tenure. Rule five, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for burger flipping. They called it opportunity. Rule six, if you mess up, it is not your parents' fault. So don't whine about your mistakes. Learn from them. Rule seven, before you were born, your parents weren't as boring as they are now. They got that way by paying your bills, cleaning your clothes, and listening to you talk about how cool you are. So before you save the rainforest from the parasites of your parents' generation, try delousing the closet in your own room. Rule eight. Your school may have done away with winners and losers, but life has not. In some schools, they have abolished failing grades and they will give you as many times as you want to get the answer right. And this bears the sl- no resemblance at all to anything we experience in life. Rule nine, life is not divided into semesters. You do not get summers off and very few employers are interested in helping you find yourself. So do that on your own time. Rule 10, television is not real life. In real life, people actually leave the coffee shop to go to their job. And finally, rule 11, be nice to nerds. Chances are you will end up working for one. Now, I think all of those rules bear a little bit of thought for us, but the most important, I think, is the first one, that life is not fair. Get used to it. Life ought to come with a warning about the side effects. But you see, we are a culture that does not want to get used to that truth. That's not true everywhere. Just go to a third world country right now. And the fact that life is not fair is just a given accepted by everybody. But that's not our culture. We live in a culture that believes every slight deserves a lawsuit. We don't want to get used to the side effects of life. We demand fairness out of life. And when our expectations are not not met, we demand that somebody be held accountable for that. And more often than not, We end up pointing our fingers at God. What are you going to do if life has been unfair to you and there isn't anybody to sue? Who are you going to blame then? 
See, the problem with the life is supposed to be fair idea underneath that myth is the insinuation about the character of God. Is God obligated to shield us from undeserved pain? Let me be clear up front. That's that's what I'm talking about today. I'm, I'm not talking about the pain you deserve because you brought it on yourself. And we all know that there is indeed a certain amount of suffering, a certain amount of hardships and struggles in life because we made bad choices or we did something wrong. But what about those times when pain comes your way and you aren't responsible? What about the injustices, the unfairnesses of life? Is God obligated to protect us from undeserved pain? I asked that on Facebook. Everybody said no. But a lot of people think he is. A lot of people think he's doing actually a bad job. A lot of people are like Job's wife. You remember Job? Says in the Bible that Job lost all of his children to death. He lost all of his fortune. His personal health had deteriorated to the point that every day for him was living in agony. And there was nothing fair about any of that. The Bible says that he was he was as righteous a man as lived on the face of the earth. And his wife came to him and said, curse God and die. Job, God has owed you better than what you're experiencing right now. God is obligated to do better for you than he's done, Job. We demand that God exercise his sovereignty in a way that that makes sense to human reason. After all, we're certain we deserve better than we've actually gotten in life. And if we don't deserve better, at least we deserve an explanation. We are entitled to know why life has been so hard for us. And so we, like Job, say, but I desire to speak to the Almighty, to argue my case with God. I've got a beef against God. I wish God would just show up and give me a chance to make clear and present my evidence that life hasn't treated me right. It's not been fair. You see, the the life is supposed to be fair has the assumption with the effect that we're putting God on trial. C.S. Lewis noticed this in Western culture and he was understanding what we are actually doing to God and he wrote this essay. The very year I was born, 1970, the essay was called God in the Dock. The dock is the British word for the place where the accused stands when he is at the bench before the court. And so God in the dock suggests that what we've done is put God on trial. And I just want to read one paragraph from that essay. The ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. Now, man is a quite kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits poverty, war, and disease, then he is willing to listen. And the trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the most important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. That's what you say when you say life is supposed to be fair. You are basically insinuating that God should be on trial for what he is letting happen in your life. But the Bible says that God is not the one in need of justification. The Bible says we are the ones in need of justification. In fact, that's exactly what Job finds out at the end of Job. God makes it clear, abundantly clear. He shows up and God is not in a good mood. And God says, tell me something, Job. You've been asking a lot of questions. Now answer a few of mine. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Are you the one that tells the sun to come up in the morning? Are you the one that knows where the orbits of all the stars 
are? Do you know where rain comes from? Do you know where the lightning is going to strike next? If you cannot run the physical universe, Job, how dare you tell me how to run the moral universe? And what Job came to understand was that he was too small to fairly judge God on the issue of fairness. And that's what we all need to understand. Nobody in this room has the mental capacity to understand the universe or are we able to say, you know, I'm, I'm qualified to judge God fairly. Nobody can do that. See, what Job came to understand was this. Write it down. What we need more than fairness from a human perspective is faith in a divine agenda. That's what we need. Faith. Now, listen, faith is not necessarily going to eliminate all of the unfairness out of our lives, but it will enlighten how I perceive and handle it. That's really the question this morning. How do we actually move from fairness to faith? So I, I want to give you three thoughts that I think will help. First is this. We need to remember that God is not the author of injustice. You ask, why didn't God create a fair world? Why did God create a, a world where there wasn't evil and injustice? Guess what? He did. The natural and the moral injustices of life are the result of sin infecting God's creation. And God did not introduce sin. We now live in a fallen creation. The moral order and the natural order is not currently what it was supposed to be. Romans chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. It is, it is longing, it is groaning to be redeemed and restored to what it once was. You see, in a fallen world, there is fallout. There are the consequences of what happens when a creation has been infected with something that was never designed to withhold or contain. And what that means then is that there is going to be in this fallen world random injustice that comes into every life. For example, Jesus said one time to people that were just like you, people trying to follow Christ. He said, you know, do you see the headlines? Did you see that tower that fell in Jerusalem and 18 people got killed. Do you think they died because they were more wicked than you are? Is that your worldview that only bad things happen to bad people? And if you're good, then nothing really bad should happen to you. But that's not it. You see, they weren't any more deserving of that than you. If you do not repent, you are going to perish with them. See, Jesus says random injustice is going to fall in every life and you cannot judge a person standing before God by how fair life has actually been to them. You say, well, if that's how it's going to be and if God knew that that kind of evil could potentially ruin his creation, then why did he create this world in the first place? Why did he create the world if he knew the potential for evil existed? I don't have a good answer. But let me ask you this. Do you have kids? Why did you bring kids into a world that you knew was just full of evil? That you knew was full of risk? God is love. God has to give us freedom of will if he's going to make us in his image. Because God is love, he cannot create us and not give us the dignity of choice. Because love is not love if you do not have a choice. It is not love unless the person has the choice to not love. 
God could not have created us in his image and not given us that choice. But I want you to remember something. God knew when he created us as free moral agents in his image that there was a risk, but that risk never once threatened his sovereignty or his control over his creation. Miles and Sarah, you know this from last week, they just got back from a cruise. They went on a cruise. And on those big giant ships, there are literally hundreds of things that you can choose to do. But you aren't in charge of where that ship is going. Only the captain is. I mean, while you're on that ride, you can make a lot of choices. You can make good choices. You can make bad choices. Like Miles, you can just park yourself in front of the buffet. You can use your time well, you can waste your time, you can do things that are good for you, you can do things that are bad for you, you can do a lot of things on that ship, but the ship is going to wind up where the captain is taking the ship. And that's how it is in life. History is headed where God is taking it. You're in for the ride. Now along the way, You can make good choices. You can make bad choices. He created you with dignity. He gave you that option, but you are not going to control where history is headed. You're not in charge of that. So remember that God is not the author of injustice, but the fact that injustice has entered into creation does not change the fact that he is still in charge of where creation is headed. And here's something else that we need to remember. We need to reaffirm God's power to bring good out of evil. God's goodness does not erase unfairness. It transcends unfairness for those of us who have faith. Faith believes that God can actually bring blessing, even good, out of injustice. Didn't God prove that to us at the cross? Was there more Ever in the history, an unjust moment than when the world crucified the only person who ever lived that never hurt anyone. But God brought good out of Calvary. Olivia read, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his Purpose, And I'm thinking, if you start focusing on your history, my guess is that the next time you say, life is supposed to be fair, just look back. Look backwards. Look at your own history. And I bet that you can see a time when something ugly came into your life and God brought something good out of that. I'll share something out of my own life. Just just one example. When I was in high school, I got into some trouble. I don't want to get into the gory details, but it involved things that even to this day, I'm ashamed of some of the choices I made. And I was spiraling out of control. My mother and my stepfather at the time were trying to figure out how to get me back on track. And so... My mom made a very difficult decision to send me to live with her brother, the preacher, in southern Ohio. We were in Orlando at the time. And uh, so I went to live with my uncle, the preacher, in Jackson, Ohio, my junior year of high school. That transition in my life was very difficult. But even though I had been making harmful choices that landed me in the spare room of my uncle's home, who was a preacher in southern Ohio, God was not absent from my life. He was still orchestrating and directing the events of my life. Because had that move not been made, I wouldn't have met another preacher in that town. His name was Hoyt Allen. And Hoyt 
Allen told me about a summer job opportunity up in northeastern Ohio where his son worked, Denny Allen. It was at a Bible camp. He said, they're looking for a few more lifeguards. Why don't you, why don't you give them a call? Here's the guy's number. So I did. And I went and I interviewed. I had to drive two hours to get there. And the guy said, you got the job, but before you start, you got to cut your hair. My hair was down past my shoulder blades. So I figured this is a giant sacrifice for the Lord, but I'll do it. Got my hair cut, went to work at this Bible camp. And you know what? They had this really pretty girl that was a cook at this Bible camp. Her name was Shannon. God is always in control. And he will always take what in the moment may seem like a very horrible thing, but he will work this out to bring him glory. And he will use your life so that you can show his glory to other people. And interestingly enough, Ohio afforded me the opportunity to make a decision in my life. You see, before I was sent to Ohio, a couple years before that, I had really firmly dedicated my life to Jesus, even told Jesus I was going to be a preacher. But I went wayward. I made really bad choices. So even before I was asked to go to Bible camp, when I was in southern Ohio, I thought, you know what? Everything's new here. Nobody knows me here. Nobody knows my life here. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to decide to live my life for Jesus because they don't know my history. So I'm just going to do it. And I can remember those first few weeks being a junior in high school and staring up at the ceiling in that spare room of my uncle's home, thinking, how unfair life had been to me. And while I was thinking those thoughts, God was really unveiling what his goodness was going to be in my life. It wasn't fair, but it was good. And had it not been the way it was, I would not have my beautiful wife. Had it not been the way it was, I would not have my two sons. Had it not been the way it was, you wouldn't hear my grandson call out for bop bop while he's preaching. He is so good to us. In the school of life, there is no such thing as pain-free learning. God uses our wounds. He, he uses our wounds to draw us to Christ. Some of you are sitting in this room and, and you are a Christian because of a wound that was in your life and it drove you closer to God. And God uses our wounds to shape our character. And some of you could actually say, you know what? It's because of this tragic event in my life that, that I began to get serious about my walk with the Lord. And he moved you out of a place of spiritual mediocrity into really, truly pursuing Jesus. And God can even use our wounds to discipline our waywardness. And some of you could say, you know what? I was making bad choices. I was going down the wrong road. I was doing things that were so self-destructive and God brought pain into my life and it turned my life around. There's a restaurant in Scotland. It's on the coast and fishermen frequently come, even to this day, to this restaurant to eat and share their stories of big catches. And back in the day, there was... Uh, Fishermen crowded into this restaurant and one of the barmaids was walking, carrying a pot of tea when one of the men was talking about his catch and his hands went out and it knocked the pot of tea off of her hand onto the freshly painted white wall and it left this big brown, ugly stain. Of course, the owner, the proprietor said, I'm going to have to repaint the wall. One man that nobody knew who was there just pleasantly drinking that day, said, well, hold on for a moment. And he had a case with him and he opened up the case and inside the case was some linseed oil and some brushes and he 
just began to go to work. And before you knew it, when he was done, using that brown stain, became a beautiful, ugly stag with a rack of antlers that seemed glorious. And he signed it at the bottom, E.H. Landseer. It was Sir Edwin Landseer, Britain's greatest wildlife artist. And he took something ugly and, and, he, and he made it beautiful. The Bible says God specializes in doing this in our life. And so we need to move from fairness to faith so that we remember he didn't author injustice. He has the power to bring good out of evil. In fact, I believe in heaven, we're going to be thanking God endlessly for the trials we have endured on this planet. You know what? We need to remember that salvation is not fair. I've actually heard this sentence uttered. Well, on judgment day, I hope I just get what I deserve. And that kind of comment reflects an abysmal lack of understanding about the holiness of God. It is it's kind of like the guy who was on trial for three days and after three days he said, you know what, I want to change my plea from innocent to guilty. The judge leans over the bench and says, well, why did you waste the court's time and money these past three days? He said, well, I thought I was evident, or innocent until I heard all the evidence against me. You know, if, if you ask the typical person if they think they're going to go to heaven, they will say, well, yeah, I think I've been pretty good. But they just haven't heard the evidence against them. We do not understand the holiness of God. We're like the lady that went to get a portrait done and the photographer shows her the proof and she's upset and she says, that picture does not do me justice. And he said, lady, you don't want justice, you want mercy. Does a guilty person throw themselves on the justice of the court? Look at what our scriptures tell us in Ephesians. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Do you know what the gospel of grace announces? It announces that God's decision is to not be fair. Fairness is that all of us go to hell. The gospel of grace announces God's decision to be more than fair. He deals with us on the basis of his goodness, not mine or yours. You say, well, how can he do that and still be a just God? He can do it because his son was willing to experience complete un fairness on our behalf and to take what we deserve in our place. That's how people get saved. And here's what's amazing. This propensity of God to be more than fair to sinners, to not give them what they deserve, but to give them what they don't deserve, that is offensive to a lot of people's definitions of fairness. You got Jonah in the Old Testament. Remember, God sent him to Nineveh and he didn't want to go because he knew God is going to be merciful to those stinking Assyrians. And that is exactly what God did. He gave grace to those people when they repented. It also bugged the older brother. He heard sounds of a party and he knew what was going on and he was stewing. I've been on this field sweating. I'm the one who has made this farm what it is today. And my younger brother goes and spends our money. He soils our name and he comes back and he just says those words. I'm sorry, daddy. And all of a sudden, dad's throwing him a party. That stinks. You'll find a lot of people get bent out of shape with the fact that God doesn't want to be fair with sinners. God wants to give them more than they deserve. But if you have ever had those thoughts, you need to remember, who are you? 
to criticize how God dispenses his grace when you yourself are in such desperate need of it yourself. We will spend eternity praising God for a salvation that not one of us ever deserved. See, we, we need to remember something, by the way, that there is a life to come. And I think just knowing that eternity is coming, just knowing that there is a life to come, gives really leverage against the unfairness of life. I came across the story of a preacher over in England. His name was Galvin Reed. And he said he met a 17-year-old boy one time. And this young man, when he was just one year old, he was at the top of a set of stairs. He was learning how to walk as a one-year-old, but he fell down the stairs. And that fall broke his back, crushed his spine and his neck. So he would never be able to walk or do things that you and I take for granted every single moment of our life. And when Mr. Reed met him, he said, son, how many years have you spent in a hospital? And he said, 13. And Reed said, I guess you're probably pretty bitter at God. He said, oh, no, God's been very fair to me. And Galvin Reed said, how can you say that? You spent 13 of your 17 years in a hospital. And he smiled. And he said, you know, the way I figure it is God's got all eternity to make it up to me. See, that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Look at Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's the truth. You see, we need a dose of truth. We need to shed the lie that life is supposed to be fair. So let me close with three truths. Here's the first one. Write it down. Suffering is mysterious. Suffering comes to all people in ways that are by no means proportionate to any human calculation of cause and effect. You cannot explain why some people go through so much more seemingly unfairness than other people do. You can't figure that out. You know, I used to think that I was supposed to when I was a baby preacher i would be asked questions like why is this happening to me and i used to think i was always supposed to have some sort of smart answer and most of the time i just bluffed anyways but i've learned better i have learned that one of the most reverent things that you can answer about the hard stuff of life is i don't know job never knew neither do we and it's in those times that you don't know that you're going to find out if you really walk by faith or if you walk by sight. And if you walk by faith, you'll get better instead of bitter. But you can take it to the bank. Suffering is mysterious. But another truth, justice is coming. Nobody gets away with anything. I mean, you see people living wicked lives and everything just seems to fall right in their laps. And people living righteous lives have to deal with unfairness and suffering and harm. And just be aware, nobody gets away with anything. Every sin will be judged. It will be judged once and for all at the cross of Christ, or it will be judged forever in hell. But every sin will be judged. And when God's day of justice comes, and this is not something we think about much because our minds don't work this way, but God is going to display his wrath. And on that day of judgment, when his wrath is displayed, God's not ashamed of his wrath. God's wrath is a part of who he is, just like his love, like his faithfulness. God's wrath brings him glory. And when every sin is judged on that day of judgment, it will be glorious. And your sin will either be judged on Calvary at the cross or it will be judged forever in hell. You say, well, why hasn't he done that yet? Why hasn't he judged every sin now? Well, the Bible says there's only one reason, because he's waiting for more to be saved. 
God's justice is delayed, but it's not denied. And if you woke up this morning and you have never had your sin judged at Calvary, at the cross, and you're still carrying that with you, well, God gave you grace to wake up this morning so that you could see this day and maybe potentially hear this message and make a decision that you want your sin to be judged at Calvary, not in hell. But understand, all sin is going to be judged. Justice is coming. We get to choose the cross or hell. One more truth, and you can go to the bank with this. God is enough. Life is unfair. Get used to it. But God is enough. You see, we all need to know the answerer more than we need the answers. That's ultimately what Job had. Job never did get All the answers. He got the answerer. After a visit with God, Job was content. And just knowing that. That's what God does. God's ultimate response to our dilemma was a visit. Not an explanation, but an incarnation. God is with us. And he came in the person of Jesus Christ to enter into our lives, to go through unfairness with us, to go through unfairness for us. And you and I, we get to commune every single day with a God just like that. And for those of us that do, we learn that's all I need. Now, I hope this never happens to you, but if you are in a building or a home that is on fire, don't do what they do on television. Don't run all over the place wondering how to get out. When a house is on fire, the air warms up and heat rises. So at about six foot in a normal house fire in a room that's being burned down, the air can reach temperatures above 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you take a gulp of that air, it will burn your lungs and kill you. And so what you're told to do is drop, go low, get on your knees, crawl to the nearest exit and find a way out. I want to suggest that's precisely what you do when you feel like all hell has broken loose in your life. Get on your knees and breathe in the air of God. He's your exit. That's exactly what Job did. Go back and read it. Job 1 verse 20. Job got up and he tore his robe. He shaved his head. And then he fell to the ground in worship. Worshiping God in the unfairness is so vital to your faith. We're going to be singing a song for our invitation this morning. Praise team can come up. It's called Graves into Gardens. And this song actually comes from the life of the prophet Elisha. And it's, it's in the Old Testament when, when he dies, they put Elisha's body in a tomb and his bones are in this tomb. And some Israelites later are digging a grave. And they're going to put a man in this grave and they are near the tomb of the prophet Elisha. But Moabites had been raiding into Israel, causing all kinds of problems and harassing the Israelites. And these men that were digging this grave see this raiding marauder group of Moabites coming. And so they decide, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm not going to die. So they open the tomb, throw the body of this dead man into the tomb of Elisha instead of digging a grave for him. And when his body of this dead man touches the bone, of the old prophet. He springs to life. His grave became a garden where life sprang up. And that's what God does for those things that you and I think it's over. It's done. It's dead. There's no hope. There's no way this can be changed. God can resurrect even when it looks like there's no way. And maybe what you need today 
is another resurrection miracle in your life. He's going to give it. You just need to believe it. Stand up. I want to pray over you this morning. Father God, help us in our unbelief. Grow our faith. Help us to see you work even when it is so hard for us to do it. Through your spirit, help us to, to shed the lie that this life is supposed to be fair. We, we praise you, God, for being more than fair to us. In your grace, in Jesus' name.